Uh, and so I'm going to try and have a little bit of flexibility here uh, in going one way or the other. Uh, and I'm going to try and hold it here so that everyone uh, can hear what we're doing. Now, I MCNP, I'm, I'm just explain my uh, title here uh, for you. MCNP is a nuclear analysis code uh, that's uh, fairly common in the nu nuclear industry. Uh, and it stands for Monte Carlo Neutron Particle. That is, it's a computer code that tracks neutrons or up to 35 other types of particles by a technique called Monte Carlo uh, process, which is a probabilistic uh, process. Uh, and uh, this is an analysis of neutrons under the assumption that Jesus' body uh, emitted neutrons uh, during this uh, flash of radiation that many of my predecessors have talked about uh, at the instant of, of the resurrection. And uh, uh, I'd like to start here, uh, some of my background. First of all, my background, uh, my first introduction to the Shroud of Turin, my wife and I were discussing this, and it must have been about 1961 or 62 when we saw a very small article in the Parade magazine that came out with a Sunday paper. She was in California, I was in Michigan. We were far too young to be married at that point. But it was maybe a little two inch picture of just the face of Jesus and a, and a little a two or three inch paragraph. And my initial thought was, no, this can't be. Because if it was real, if it was really the authentic shroud of Jesus, it would be the most, one of the most important possessions of the human race, maybe second to the Bible. But, uh, and I've never heard of it, so it can't be possible. Well, in later thinking about it, I thought, well, I need to be a little bit more open-minded about it. Uh, and so as time went by, I kind of put that on the back burner. I uh, took degrees in a bachelor degree and master's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan. Graduated in 1971, took a job at General Atomics uh, in San Diego, right next to the ocean. Beautiful site. Uh, where I did uh, design work on advanced nuclear reactors. I was the main core designer for the gas cooled fast breeder reactor. Also worked on the modular high temperature gas cooled reactor. Uh, and trigger reactors. And worked there for about 24 years. But during the process, I, I was greatly encouraged uh, when the uh, team in 78 went to investigate the Shroud of Turin um, and then read the article in the June issue of 1980. How many saw this when, when it came out? Wonderful four page uh, fold out uh, on the Shroud of Turin. And I was convinced at that point that the Shroud of Turin. Uh, was authentic. Uh, and then I was kind of shocked when in 1989 the uh, statistical analysis came out uh, which said that it's a hoax. Uh, and, and the date was uh, 1260 to 1390. And I didn't know what to make of that. And I, you know, how things are, you're kind of hesitant to read things that disagree with what you, your preconceived ideas. So maybe I didn't read it until a year or two later. But I remember going to the library, and, and they had to go back into the archives for it at that point. And I sat down and I read it. And it didn't take me a long time to read it. But afterwards, I remember scratching my head for a minute or two. And then, you know, starting here in 1971 uh, with General Atomics, I, I've been running, I've been calculating neutron distributions in nuclear reactors. That was my job. Uh, and so when, when I read this, after scratching my head for a minute or two, I thought, I know why that is. And that was back in maybe um, 1991 or maybe 1990. Uh, but I never had time, computer resources, and the computer code uh, to do the calculations that occurred to me at that point. Now, the, the idea that occurred to me that, uh, Everything that I see in this paper is easily explainable on, under the assumption that neutrons were released from Jesus' body. Uh, and that's the second part of the title that we have there. Um, so I worked for 24 years at General Atomics doing core physics design for advanced nuclear reactors. Uh, and then when the project was zeroed out by Department of Energy, thank you, I uh, worked at various U.S. Department of Energy sites for 14 years as a consultant, uh, primarily doing nuclear criticality safety calculations using the computer code that I'm using now. 
Now I'm doing the MCMP calculations on my home computer. I have a, a quad core AMD a CPU, and these calculations take between 6 and 13 hours each uh, on the computer. Fortunately, it's a quad core, so I can run uh, four of them at a time. Uh, but you can see why we had to wait in order to have the capability to do the calculation. Um, okay. So uh, the outline here is I'm going to discuss the carbon-14 dating of the Shroud of Turin in 1988, why it may not have been accurate, the hypothesis of neutron emission, uh, what MCNP is, uh, and the nature of the calculations, and then the need for further testing and questions. Now, uh, on the abstract that you may have read, uh, the results that I reported on that abstract were the results of my preliminary calculations. Now, that was my A series of calculations. Uh, A1 up through, I think, was about uh, A45. And so those were preliminary calculations. I've now done about 350 or so of, of various length of calculations. Uh, the calculations that I'm doing currently, uh, the, the code uh, is a very simplistic code. Uh, conceptually, it merely follows one neutron after another. So uh, the computer code uh, goes in and it, it generates a random number between 0 and 1 to determine where on the x-axis of your defined geometry it's going to start the neutron. It goes in and chooses another random number to determine where on the, on the y-axis it's going to start the neutron. It chooses another random number to determine where on the z-axis it's going to start the neutron. So then when it knows where it's going to start the neutron, then it goes in and chooses three different random numbers between 0 and 1 to determine the x, y, and z coordinates of the direction that that neutron is going to go. Now, you may or may not specify the speed. Uh, if you're not specifying it, you can use random numbers to choose the, the energy if you're putting in a spectrum, for example. So by a long process of choosing random numbers, it follows one neutron from where it chooses to start the neutron uh, initially going in a certain direction at a certain energy, then by a selection of random numbers, it, it determines uh, how that neutron interacts with the materials within the geometry that you're defining. And uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but you can see where we're going here. I'm going to be presenting the results uh, of those calculations to you. Now, as we see here, uh, we've talked about the the, the three little samples were selected right here. This is just the par uh, one part, the, the front side. You can see the head here and the legs coming down. So that the sample region was right down at the very bottom, down by the feet. Now, one assumption that I'm making on my calculations, not knowing how the cloth was folded, I'm assuming that this, this outer area of the cloth was folded underneath his legs. Now, that's important for my calculations. Um, and it's feasible. We don't know how it was folded, but that's a good, good suggestion. I mean, if I was going to be folding, uh, putting a cloth over to keep animals or insects out, I want to fold it underneath to some extent. So that is one assumption that, that we're taking. Now, if we take a, a close-up of, of this region, the diagram that I made up here uh, shows the, the main section of the shroud. It shows the side strip here. It shows the seam along here. Uh, I think there is good reason to believe that that side strip was cut off, uh, perhaps to wrap around the body in, in the opposite direction. But you can see here this, this very large second was torn off. The sample was cut right here. They cut on, and they were planning on sending this out to three different laboratories uh, in Tucson, Arizona, Zurich, Switzerland, and Oxford, England. Uh, and so they, they cut me this cut which actually was more material than was necessary. They then cut off the first section with the intention of sending that to Arizona. They cut off the section, second section to send to Zurich. They cut off the third section to send for, to Oxford. And then they realized that the first section was too small, was smaller than the other two. Uh, and so I call this A1, that's the large piece. They then cut off a second piece, I call that A2, which was a little bit smaller. And they sent both A1 and A2 to the laboratory in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, this piece is still in existence, this cutoff material. I hope all this is still in existence. 
uh, the, the race sample here, uh, I believe it's still in existence. So there are pieces of material that can be used for testing that are not under control of the Catholic Church and would not have to go through the Pope to get permission. Is that, I believe that's the case. Um, you, you might not. Uh, this is true. This is true. I think the laboratories that did the work would be very receptive to my calculations because I'm talking on the very same plane as they are. Uh, and they're probably using the same computer code as I am for a lot of their analysis of their geometries. Um, so th this was the reference to the uh, journal, uh, British journal Nature, uh, that was in 1989. The title was Radiocarbon Dating of the Shroud of Turin by P.E. Damon and a host of others. So often when uh, this reference is made reference to, it's made reference to under the first author, that being Damon. Now the results of the statistical uh, analysis uh, that was reported uh, in this 1989 analysis, they came up with a calibrated date of 1260 to 1390, and I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, therefore, they concluded the Shroud of Turin is, is not authentic, it is a fake created in the Middle Ages. Uh, now, the, their actual analysis returned three different values, you know, one value from each laboratory, that were then sim was simply uh, average. The average value from those three laboratories was 1260 AD plus or minus 31. Now, when, when we say this, 1260 plus or minus 31, realize that's not one specific value. It's a distribution of values. Uh, the peak of the distribution, it's called a Gaussian distribution, the peak of that distribution would be at the year 1260, uh, and the, uh, the one sigma uh, would be the width at half height. So it would be uh, the, the year uh, with the one sigma uncertainty. Uh, so this is a value that was actually calculated by their equipment. They then took that value and they, they uh, applied that value to a correction curve to correct for the amount, the varying amount of carbon-14 that's produced in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and they think they have a pretty good handle on that based upon carbon dating of tree rings. So it depends on the counting of tree rings, which is interesting. Um, so as we move forward here, so I'm, I'm going to be using the 1260. I have no way to get in, into this correction, a calibrated date, and, and this is what the code is going to be calculating. Um, now, this is the situation. If, if we had uh, down here uh, on the x-axis, we have years since the death of the a plant or animal. So this carbon-14 dating is often used on any kind of uh, life because uh, living plants uh, are bringing in uh, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide from the environment. Uh, and so that the carbon-14 that's produced in the upper atmosphere by gamma rays coming in gradually diffuses and circulates down to where the plants live. So the plants take in this carbon dioxide containing a very small uh, part of carbon-14, that's the important item that, that we're interested in. Um, and then, uh, so that while the plant is living, it's taking in new carbon and new carbon-14, and at the same time, the carbon-14 that's already in the plant is gradually decaying, but there's an equilibrium that's reached. But when, that, when the flax plant is cut down, to make linen, for example, right at that point, see right here, this is level uh, up to this point, it's level up to that point, but as soon as the plant is cut down, the, the amount of carbon-14 starts to decay, um, and it's decaying with a half-life of 5,730 years, which means that in 5,730 years, this curve will be down to 50%. And so it decays relatively slowly. But when, the, when they take the samples from the Shroud of Turin, for example, and they measure 92% of the carbon-14 still present, uh, and that's what we have here, this value over in this curve, that's 92% of the carbon-14 is still present. They come down on the curve and they say, it must be 690 years old. 
No, it might be a little bit strange, but they, they always do this in terms of 1950. That, that's the standard from which they start. So 1950 minus 690 uh, years old gives the 1260 AD date that we saw on the previous slide. And this is a situation uh, without any new carbon-14 being produced uh, or added to uh, the samples at any point during the life. Let's go to the next one. Now this is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that the scientists who did the experiments measuring the carbon-14 quantity assumed, as you normally would, they assumed that they were on this black curve. Um, after all, uh, what human bodies have absorbed neutrons? Very few. None that we know. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting here, none that we know under normal conditions, what I'm suggesting here is that there was a burst of neutrons in the tomb at the time of the resurrection. Uh, those neutrons would then go out, they, they, uh, slow down by interactions out, out in the limestone of the tomb, an average neutron uh, actually, even if, if released at a thermal energy, very low energy, it goes through 175 different scattering events before it's absorbed. That's one item the computer code tells me. But uh, if, uh, if neutrons are released by the body of Jesus, a very small fraction of them will be absorbed in the shroud because it's in the tomb. And that's where the neutrons are. And a small fraction of those that are absorbed in the shroud are absorbed in the nitrogen-14 in the shroud, which is a very small uh, amount of nitrogen-14 in the shroud. When a neutron is absorbed in the nitrogen-14, it kicks out a proton, and what's re what remains, since the number of protons determine what the element is, it goes from nitrogen down to carbon-14. That carbon-14 that's produced by a neutron absorption in the nitrogen-14 is indistinguishable from the nitrogen-14 that's produced in the upper atmosphere, gradually diffuses down, and is taken into the plant. So that the scientists who are doing the measurements, uh, they think that they're on this curve, but what I'm suggesting is that neutrons were emitted in the tomb at the resurrection, uh, increasing the, the amount of carbon-14 by about 16%. That carbon-14, then, once that burst of neutrons is gone, uh, it decays then with a half-life of 5,730 years, just like the neutrons would on this curve. But if you're on this curve and you measure 92% of the carbon-14 that you thought was there originally, you see the difference? That would make it... Uh, 1,920 years old, 1950 minus 1920, gives you 30 AD. That's the math right there. So that if you, were, if you knew you were on this curve, the carbon-14 would give you a date of 30 AD. They didn't know they were on that curve. Why would they? You don't expect to have neutrons uh, in a tomb where a dead body is residing. Okay. Now, the big picture. So, if neutrons were released from Jesus' body in the tomb, uh, then some of them would have been absorbed in nitrogen-14 in the Shroud of Turin to produce new carbon-14 atoms, which would cause the Shroud of Turin to be carbon-14 dated younger than its true age, and potentially much younger than its true age, depending on how many neutrons were absorbed in the nitrogen-14 in the shroud. Now, just so that we don't lose everyone here, we need to explain even what a neutron is. I mean, you don't go to the grocery store and buy a package of neutrons, right? They, they just, you know, you, you don't uh, swerve your car to avoid a neutron on the street. You know, this isn't done. Uh, so, uh, we have to understand the concept of what an atom is. And I'm going to deal with this in, in terms uh, of a carbon atom. Now, a carbon atom, let's talk about the electrons first. There, there'd be two orbits. You know, it's like a little solar system. That's the idea, where the very heavy mass is in the center, 
And, and in our solar system, the relatively light planets are then circling around, uh, except in the case of the atom. Each orbit is occupied by more than one item. So that in our understanding of a carbon atom, there would be two electrons in the inner orbit and four electrons in the outer orbit. Now, the two electrons in the inner orbit fill that orbit. But the next orbit out can contain up to eight electrons. And that little fact is why carbon can form millions of organic compounds and life is possible in the universe. Isn't that interesting? Let's move on. Um, so what we have here is we have six electrons uh, out, outside circling around very rapidly uh, around the nucleus. The heavy mass is in the center. So that there, each electron is a negative charge, yet the, the atom is neutral. So therefore, with six negative charges on the outside of the nucleus, we must have six protons on the inside, each proton having uh, one positive charge, so that the atom balances six positive charges in the nucleus, six electrons on the outside. Now, the number of neutrons in that nucleus that's holding everything together, you see, because if there were six, just six protons in the nucleus and nothing else, the positive charges on the six protons would repel each other. Uh, the nucleus would not be stable. It would immediately fly apart and it would cease to be carbon. Uh, so what there has to be is a number of neutrons in this nucleus in order to hold it together by what's called the weak and the strong nuclear forces, two out of the four forces in nature uh, applied to the nucleus. Uh, and so, for example, carbon, uh, right up here, carbon with a six, lower six to the left, that's the number of protons. The upper 12 to the right, that's the total number of nucleons, the protons plus the neutrons, uh, in that carbon atom. So that the number of carbon-12 would have six protons plus six neutrons. Uh, carbon-12 is 99% of carbon. Now, carbon-13 would have six protons and seven neutrons. That's 1% of carbon. Both those are stable. But once we get to carbon-14, there's too many neutrons to make the nucleus stable, and it gradually decays with a half-life of 5,730 years. Okay, you see where we're going here. So that what I've drawn here is actually the nucleus of carbon-14 with six protons and eight neutrons. Too many to be stable. Now, uh, back to the question of why aren't we familiar with neutrons? Well, the, the answer is that neutrons are held in the nucleus of, of, of all the atoms, in the nuclei, let me say it that way, uh, of all the atoms in our body. So that because the neutrons, as well as the protons, are inside the nuclei, they're stable, and we don't see them as separate particles. But consider this. Uh, these, these are the compositions of an average human body, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, those are the weight percents, eight, eight others, 1.8 uh, weight percent, and then many others uh, less than uh, a hundredth of a percent. Um, okay, so if we take those percentages of the materials in our body, uh, then we can calculate this table, which is in an average body. Now, I'm defining an average body here as a body of 170 pounds, because that's the estimate uh, of Jesus' weight. And I did these calculations to calculate atom densities uh, for my computer code. So the components of the atoms in your body, as well as Jesus' body, would be ne neutrons, protons, and electrons. I give you the number here that are in your body. Have you ever thought about this? So that in your body, if, if you weigh 170 pounds, a little bit more, then ratio this up, a little bit less, ratio it down. Okay, 2.09 times 10 to the 28th. If you're not familiar with scientific notation, that's 2 with 28 zeros following it. I'm not even sure how to say that. Okay? Uh, and, and then uh, the number of protons, there's actually more protons than there are neutrons, 2.5 times 10 to the 28th. Same number of electrons as protons in your body. But then I, I give you the weight percent in your body of neutrons, protons, and electrons. In other words, I'm saying 45% of your body weight 
is neutrons. So there's plenty of neutrons to go around. Okay? Just you don't see them because they're bound up uh, in the nuclei of, of the atoms. Okay? No, uh, in, in the resurrection, in the resurrection, Jesus' body disappeared from the tomb. That's one of the things that happened. Many other things happened, but that's the one that I'm focusing on. Now, we realize here that Jesus' body consisted of tissues. His tissue, you know, whether heart or liver or skin or whatever tissue you want to talk about. It, those tissues were composed of uh, proteins, which are organic compounds. Those organic compounds are, are composed of atoms, uh, and our molecules. Those molecules are composed of atoms. Those atoms are composed of neutrons, protons, and electrons. So to ask the question, where did Jesus' body go, is to ask the question, uh, where did the atoms go, or where did the neutrons, protons, and electrons go? Now, I'm going to give you two different options here uh, that you can choose from. <laughs> Uh, the, the layman's answer might be something like this. Uh, uh, they, or if you're talking about the body, it went to heaven uh, based on the power of God. Uh, and that's fine. If that makes you happy, that, that's fine. Uh, but, but the physicist here, I'm, I'm suggesting that the physicist ought to answer this way. Uh, they transitioned to an alternate dimensionality by an unknown process. Now, why would I say it that way? Um, hmm? Because I'm honest. Oh, that's an excellent answer because I'm, try I'm trying to be honest here. Um, think about back in the history of science. Okay? Uh, when, when science just became founded, they, they were dealing with three items mentioned in Genesis 1.1, by the way. Uh, mass, uh, space, and time. Matter, space, and time. Uh, and that's what, that's what science was related to, matter, space, and time. And then along went, you know, hundreds of years, and they finally realized that, that you could relate those three together in a special way and come up with a new item that's uh, very important for consideration, and that, that is energy. And just in the last couple decades, there's a brand new item, okay? What era are we in now? The era of information. You relate matter, space, and time together in a special way, and it becomes not energy, but information. And it's the information. It's not how, do, how does your body function? Why can you be alive? Why aren't you just a, a dead bun bunch of chemicals on the floor? What's the information content in your genes? Okay? Now, um, so that we've gradually come to th those realizations. Um, so modern physics has, has made a lot of progression. But one area of modern physics, modern physics can be very strange, by the way. The modern, modern physics, uh, <laughs> modern, one branch of modern physics is string theory. String theorists uh, attempt to explain why the uh, four different forces of nature uh, react, uh, behave the way that they do, and how they interact, and whether they can be uh, brought together in some kind of unifying theory. Uh, another objective of string theory is to try and explain why matter has weight, for example. Now, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, and usually how they, they do their calculations is, is that they do their calculations in higher dimensionalities, which is very easy to do in mathematics. So that in our reality, uh, we recognize four dimensions, three being space. You know, over in the corner of the room, you have an X, a Y, and a Z. And from, from relative to that origin in the corner of the room, you can locate every object in the entire universe. That, those are the three dimensions of space. There's also time. So we recognize, our, our perceptions recognize four different dimensions. But string theorists work in anywhere from 10 to 26 dimensions with success. So it being evidence uh, that our perceived reality is simply a part, a sub, sub part of a much larger reality. Uh, so that I see the resurrection of Jesus as a transition into another aspect of this dimensionality that is the larger reality. And that, now each atom 
uh, in this body would retain it, its um, association with the other atoms when it made the transition, thus allowing him to come back uh, in, in transitioning uh, back into our reality and thus appearing in, in the upper room without walking through the door or the window or even the wall. He simply, bam, he beams in according to Star Trek terminology. Okay? Entering in by a transition from an alternate dimensionality. Um, now I say that for a reason and, and we'll get there. Now in saying all that, the physicist ought to recognize that it's an unknown process. Well, when we say unknown process, we can't exclude possibilities. We have to say that, we have to admit that if it's an unknown process, then there is no reason to rule out the possibility of neutrons or any other subatomic particle being emitted. Okay? Are you with me so far? So, so there's a, logic, a lot of logic, a long logical sequence uh, to this. So therefore, what we need is detailed calculations, Ca computer calculations, uh, were performed by myself using the MCMP nuclear analysis code to determine what would happen if neutrons were released from Jesus' body uh, due to the resurrection. Now, I'm going to give you the conclusion at this point. I'm not going to keep this from you to the end. The conclusion is that if 3.04 times 10 to the 18th thermal neutrons were released during the disappearance of Jesus' body in the tomb in his resurrection, it would increase the average carbon-14 com content in the Shroud of Turin samples by 16%, which is what I showed you was needed. Uh, this would shift the carbon-14 date for the Shroud of Turin samples from 30 AD to 1260 AD. Now that's one of the conclusions. Now I've done a lot of calculations, and I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to show you the result of 10 of the calculations, because there's just too much data to it. Now let me go on with that previous slide here and expand on that a little bit. Um, we were talking about 3.04 times 10 to the 18th. Well, what is that? It's a huge, that, that's bigger than the national debt. <laughs> I mean, that, you might say that's a huge number. 3.04 times, since 3.04 times 10 to the 18th neutrons must be released in the body to produce a 1260 AD date in the sample region, and there are 2.09 times 10 to the 28th neutrons in the body. I showed you that number before. The fraction of neutrons that must be emitted from the body is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10th. Now it becomes an extremely small number. It's 1.5 neutrons in every 10 billion that are in your body need to be emitted to, from, or released from your body, from Jesus' body, to change the uh, date uh, that the carbon-14 dating gave from 30 AD up to 1260 AD. Let me rephrase it, yeah, second point here. So, in the disappearance of the body, the process by which the neutrons transitioned into the alternate dimensionality, there's the phraseology that I like. The neutrons, so in the disappearance of the body, the process by which the neutrons transitioned into the alternate dimensionality was 99.9999998 percent efficient. Now, if you put 0 0.7015, that, that's the, the amount that need to be released in the tomb. So the vast majority of neutrons that I'm saying that were in his body properly transitioned to the alternate dimensionality and an extremely small fraction uh, were not. Now, uh, it's not just one value that we're concerned about, but it's uh, actually three values. Uh, um, and this is the result of the statistical analysis as reported by Damon. Arizona gave a value of 1304, actually a distribution, uh, with 1304 being the peak value of that distribution. Zurich, 1274, Oxford, 1200. So, but it was very interesting. What did they do to get to the 1260? They took these three values and basically averaged them. Now, they did it statistically, they did it properly. But they basically averaged them. But the authors of the document recognize something very strange about this data that I'm showing you right here. There's something wrong with it, just by looking at it. Uh, they concluded that the range of the sample values, and this is a quote directly out of their document, the range of the sample values was inconsistent with the stated random measurement error. So in other words, I'm sorry, uh, 
this difference between 1304 and 1200 is larger than what they should see uh, when you look at the statistical uncertainty on those values. So, in a very simplistic manner here, uh, we're not going to attempt to repeat all their high-powered statistics. I don't think I could. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this distribution minus this distribution. So 1304 minus 1200 is 104. Years difference between the two. Now, we have a distribution on both these. So you have to take these two values into account. So we need an uncertainty on that 104 difference. And when you do the statistical uh, combination of these two, what you do, you take 31, you square it, you take 30, you square it, you add the two values together, and you take the square root. Relatively simple. So you end up with a distribution when you subtract this minus this. The answer is 104 plus or minus 43. Maybe I should show that on this one. But that's the difference between the two. 104 plus or minus 43. Well, the important thing here is that 104 is 2.4 times the one sigma uncertainty of 43. 2.4 is a high number. Okay? It's beyond the 95% confidence level. That's why Damon concluded that the range of the sample values, that, that's these, was inconsistent with the stated random measurement error. He said there's something wrong, and then he ignored it. <laughs> it's interesting. Maybe, maybe too many cooks spoil the broth on this. You know, so many authors. I, I don't know. It was what? Million pounds sterling. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, now I'm going to I'm going to show you where the plots are for these three different values. Uh, here is uh, Oxford, uh, Zurich, uh, and Arizona. Let me back up here. Yeah, okay. Uh, Oxford with the uncertainty range, uh, Zurich with its uncertainty range, Arizona. Now there's actually two values that we see in the literature for Arizona. Uh, often in the literature they make an assumption that it was only the larger piece that was sent to the laboratory in Tucson that was actually dated. If that be the case, since it was far to the far right, it would, it would be placed further to the right on, on this x-axis, which is the distance from the edge of the shrub. Um, that's where it would be placed. If, if both the larger and the smaller sample, A1 plus A2, were included uh, in the analysis, which seems to be the case in the paper, uh, then be, because A2 was the furthest on the left, that would bring this value to the left on this plot, and it would plot right there. Okay? So we have distance from the edge of the shroud. That's what I'm plotting here. Uh, so that th this value, for example, was about 4.85 uh, centimeters from the edge of the shroud, and, and this one was further from the edge of the shroud. But notice, one, on, on this plot, if, you get, if you're getting further from the edge of the shroud, you're getting closer to the center of the body mass. And I'm saying that neutrons are emitted by the body. So you're getting closer to where the majority of the neutrons are being emitted. No, so, so what Damon and his associates did was they took these three values and simply averaged them. Now, I plotted that here in the black line, that black dashed line. That's the average uh, of 1260. And you see that does not go through the three values. Do you notice that? It goes through one, but it has the wrong slope. Now, just looking at it, doesn't it look like there's something wrong with that? Well, it does to me. Uh, let, let's move on. Now, well, I don't, this is if the three samples are averaged, which, which when they're averaging it, uh, it's assuming that there are no neutrons. If someone told them that there was neutrons emitted, they wouldn't average them. Let's move on. Okay, if, if someone were to tell uh, the individuals doing the experiments in these three laboratories, that it was absolutely certain that neutrons were emitted in the tomb of Jesus at the point of his resurrection, they wouldn't simply average these three values. They would say, oh, we have to take MCNP and do the calculation as to how the neutron distribution uh, is uh, in the tomb. They would do exactly what I've done here. Or they, they could use other codes as well. Um, Okay, let, let's move on. 
Now, now this inconsistency, this, this bad fit between the three values has, has been noted and analyzed by uh, several different uh, analysts. So it's not something that I'm pointing out. It was in the original document, and it's been analyzed and pointed out by several uh, individuals. For example, in the 1999 Richmond Conference, uh, Brian uh, Walsh, in his paper, the 90, 1988 Shroud of Turin Radiocarbon Test Reconsidered, uh, said that, uh, reported doing a detailed statistical analysis using two different common uh, statistical analysis of variance, those, those are the correct words. And his conclusion that, that the Oxford and the Arizona sample values were statistically different. Now that, that's, that means something in, in the terminology. What that means is that they're outside of the range of the measurement error and that something is going on between those values that's causing them to be different. Okay, are you following me? So he agrees with this. Um, and so this, this is a least squares linear fit uh, of those three values. I'm excluding the, the right-hand Arizona value. I don't think that one pertains to what we're do doing with here. Because if you had to include a plot through those three values with the previous far right Arizona, the curve would be concave down. My calculations show a neutron flux that's concave up, a neutron density that's concave up. This curve, the Arizona value, ha has to be above uh, a linear line, and, that, and that's what we're showing here. So I'm only including the Arizona value with, its, uh, with both pieces of, of the material sent to Arizona. So we have a least squares linear fit, which minimizes the, the deviation of the reported values from that line. So this is computer generated. Least squares linear fit. Uh, you notice the equation here, y equals 57.1 x plus 920.7. Uh, well, this is related to where this line crosses the y-axis. This is the slope of this line. So the least squares linear fit has a slope of 57.1 years per centimeter. That is, each centimeter you go up on the shroud, the date is going to change by 57.1 years, according to this, this concept of neutrons being released in the body of Jesus. Now, the proposed cause of, the vari of this variation that we see here, uh, a horizontal line doesn't pass through it, a slope line uh, does pass through it, and so that's what we want to achieve. The true value of the carbon-14 in each of the three samples was different due to the different amounts of neutron absorption as you go from one location to the next. Every centimeter is different uh, due to the shape of the neutron distribution in the tomb. Okay. Now, it gets a little bit more complex. I showed you one, one curve here before where it was coming up 16% up and then one curve was decaying. You remember that? It's actually three different curves because we have three different samples. So these three different samples have three different uh, amounts of carbon-14 being produced in them. Here, Arizona is 16.66% increase. Uh, Zurich is 12, uh, 16.24%. Oxford is 15.24%. So that when they decay with, with the, the known decay constant, you bring the values over to the curve that you think you're on, that's where we get the three different values. Okay. Is it getting fuzzy yet? Okay. There, are, no, there are three mysteries to all this. Science is often defined by new hypotheses trying to solve unknowns or trying to solve mysteries. Uh, this is what Einstein did in, in his uh, theory of relativity. Um, the Michelson-Morley experiment had just been done, which uh, proved that the speed of light was independent of direction, whether you're flowing with, with the ether pervading all of space, or whether you're against it or crossways to the flow of ether that the Earth must have been moving through, because light is a wave and therefore it must have an e a medium to travel from the sun to get to our eyes, therefore there must be a medium in space, they call it an ether, 
Uh, Michaels and Morley's experiment was no. They said there was no difference at all in the speed of light depending on where we turn our, our rotating table. Very strange. They had to check that over and over. They, they didn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. Because obviously you, you can go outside and you can see the light coming from the sun. They couldn't explain it. Uh, the other item was, was the orbit of Mercury. Uh, the orbit of Mercury is not a circle. Uh, it, it's an oval, uh, and the perihelion, the long point of that perihelion, gradually goes around the sun. And they couldn't explain the speed of that perihelion going around the sun. Uh, uh, they couldn't explain it using only Newton's laws of celestial mechanics, which had been proven for 300 years. And they said, well, of course, Newton's equations are accurate. Um, so, um, Einstein came up with his, his theory to explain the mysteries in his day. So we have three mysteries. How can the Shroud of Turin be authentic if carbon-14 dating placed its origin in the Middle Ages? Next, why was there such poor agreement between the carbon-14 dates for the three Shroud of Turin samples? Next, how can the Sudarium of Oviedo be authentic if carbon-14 dated it to about 700 AD? So I'm bringing in the Shroud of Turin the Sudarium of Oviedo at this point, too. Um, now, so the objective here is to explain these three mysteries with one hypothesis. And that's one of the basic features of science, when you explain multiple mysteries by simple hypothesis. Now, the simple hypothesis is that neutrons were released from Jesus' body in the tomb. That's fairly simply stated, isn't it? You know, I don't know the mechanism. You tell me the mechanism for Jesus' resurrection, and then I'll talk about, uh, you know, how neutrons were released, okay? Um, now, the reasons that, that we're going in the direction of assuming that neutron emission takes place, first of all, it does explain the three mysteries. Second of all, uh, it's consistent with the disappearance of the body. The neutrons in his body go somewhere. Why can't some of them simply be left behind? A very, very small fraction of them. And it's consistent with the formation of the image by particles. I've long preferred uh, protons or some other charged particle deposited on the charge being emitted from the body. Well, if protons or some other charged particle is being emitted from the body to form the image, then why not neutrons? It, it's kind of a, a simplistic argument, but I think it's, it's weighty. Now, another reason for this is that it was the very first published explanation for carbon-14 date given by Phillips. Uh, in the very same uh, issue of the journal Nature, and this has already been referred to. Uh, and, and he said uh, this, uh, second point, the body may also have radiated neutrons which would have irradiated the shroud and changed some of the nuclei to different isotopes by neutron capture. In particular, some carbon-14 could have been generated. Relatively simple concept for a nuclear engineer. Okay? Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and that's why, it, you know, it, I just read the article and within two minutes, that's what, what I decided must be the case. Um, so MCNP stands for Monte Carlo Neutron Particle. Uh, it was developed over the past six decades by a team of people at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. They're, they continue to work on it. And a matter of fact, it's the code where all knowledge related to uh, subatomic particles is placed in this code. Uh, the number of people that are running it worldwide, probably currently at any time, probably several hundred. How many have it? Oh, maybe two or three thousand have access to it and could run it uh, if they have need to. So it is used worldwide, not only in nuclear, but also in, in a nuclear, nuclear medicine, for example. Uh, radiation detector design, etc. How accurate is it? Well, it's been verified to be accurate by comparison of calculated results with nuclear experiments. Well, how many, how many facilities? Hundreds of facilities. How many experiments? Thousands of experiments. Even the U.S. government regards it as accurate. Okay, so, that, so that when the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy come to your nuclear facility to make sure that you've done your criticality safety analysis correctly to assure that there, there can be no criticality accident within the United States if the operators do what they're told. They, they're not questioning the accuracy of MCMP. They're questioning your logic in the document and, and whether you're running it correctly. So this is the diagram 
my, my best attempt at a three-dimensional diagram uh, of a typical shroud. Now, uh, archaeologist uh, Lean Rittmeyer says that uh, over a thousand tombs have been excavated in Jerusalem. Uh, in t they typically have a left bench, and, and this is what you see here. They have a left bench on the left side of the, what's called the pit, or the stand-up area. Uh, there's a back bench, and there's a right bench. So there's a low uh, step you have to step over to get into the pit area. Uh, the doorway is, is a smallish thing, and you have to stick your, your first leg in, and you have to move your body in gradually, and then drag your, your other leg in. Uh, the point being here, as Lean Rittmeyer pointed out, when the biblical text refers to John and Peter running up to the tomb, you remember what it says, John got there first, he bent down and he looked in. Well, if you go right up to the opening, and you look in, there wouldn't be light coming in. You'd, you'd be blocking the light. So he has to st step back a bit. So when he looks in, he sees the claw, the, the burial claws, they have to be on the back bench. Okay? So that's where I modeled them, on the back bench. Uh, most people are right-handed, so on the back bench, I put Jesus' head to the right. Okay? Whether it's on the right or the left makes no difference. Uh, if the head is to the right, then the wall is on his right side. If his head is to the left, then the wall is on the left side. That's the only difference it would make. Uh, and then I, I placed the face cloth over here on the assumption that the face cloth was put, uh, wrapped over and tied over his head while he was on the cross. It was over his head uh, while he was being transported to the tomb. He's brought into the tomb. He, his body is laid down on the bottom piece um, of the shroud. The head cloth is probably the better term. The head cloth is then taken off, wrapped or folded up, and laid probably very close to that uh, back bench where the body is. Uh, and so th this is where uh, I expect these items to be. Uh, and so that in my model, this is a, a picture generated by my computer codes uh, on the model uh, of the body. Now, this is the bench on which he's on. I'm not showing all the limestone around. I modeled the tomb with about a meter of limestone on the walls, ceiling, and floor. A meter is fine for my purposes. I checked that out. Uh, and so what we have here, we have his head forward position, we have his body and abdomen with the arms wrapped into the body. We, we have a truncated frustrum. Don't you like that term? We have a truncated frustrum for his leg. A, a, a tilted box shape. That, that's better. A, and then also down here for the, for the feet. Um, a top view of, of the body model shows this. We have the head to the right, the body, uh, abdomen, uh, chest area, arms wrapped into the body. We have two legs coming down, the feet down here. Uh, this outer line here, that's the shroud as I'm modeling it. Just an open box, just for simplicity. I have to be able to have some way to do the calculations. Let me go back. So that you see here, you see how it, it extends out and then underneath the body as well. That's my modeling of the shroud. Good enough for my purposes. Now, I'm going to show you a series of, of results here and uh, conditions for the following calculations. 3.04 times 10 to the 18th neutrons were emitted from Jesus' body in the tomb. That's, that's what it takes to normalize the results to 1260 AD at the toes. Now, the other assumptions here, that uh, these neutrons were released during the disappearance of the body in the resurrection. In other words, I'm, I'm assuming here that the Disappearance of the body took some finite amount of time. Maybe very, very short, maybe very short, maybe short, maybe long, I don't know. But however uh, the, the time dimension uh, of that disappearance of the body went, the neutrons were emitted in correlation with that. So that as the neutrons were transitioning, as the atoms were transitioning to the alternate dimensionality, a very, very small fraction of neutrons were being released. Um, also, neutrons were emitted from uh, random locations in the body. That is, each gram of material in the body had an equal chance to emit the next neutron. Okay? But uh, since your body has most of the weight up here, that's where most of the neutrons are going to be emitted. Okay, continuing here, neutrons were emitted with random initial directions, and it turns out that if I use an initial neutron energy, a 0.0253 electron volts, I get nice results. Now, I ran these calculations up to, what was it, 
one MeV, maybe 10 MeV, you know, all the way up into the normal range. But this energy here is thermal. It's in equilibrium uh, with the just random vibration of the atoms. Um, so that what we're seeing here is that the neutrons were not emitted with any energy, they're simply left behind. Which is an interesting point. Uh, and I'm assuming 20 centimeters uh, between the limestone wall and the sample region. Uh, this is very important. This is the total distribution of neutron, this is the total neutron distribution in the tube. Now the head is down here to the far right, then the body, then the legs coming down here, and right down at the end is the toes. The second blue point from the left is where they took the samples. Now what you see there is that where they took the sample was at a very high slope region. <coughs> very high gradient region. And this is what I realized back in 1991, based on my experience of running neutron distributions. Um, the other three curves relate to the energy. Now, what, once you know the, the neutron distribution, you can calculate the uh, distribution of neutrons absorbed in the nit nitrogen 14 in the shroud. So it's very similar. In other words, the second point down here uh, on the left, that's where the sample is. That's where your high slope region is located. Uh, and the, from that curve, I can then calculate what the core carbon-14 date will be if you take a sample there and take it to the laboratory and date it. So this, this value, the second point from the left, that's your 1260 value that the laboratory got. Now look at that curve for a second. Where does it go? Look it up here in the body region. 8,500 AD. That's where the computer code predicts that, that the sample value will produce that age if sample up in this region right, right on, under his back. Okay, let's move on. Um, so that if I take the bottom four points and I fit those bottom four points, four calculated points, with, with a, a polynomial least squares fit, I give the equation right here. You can see the result goes through all three points very close to the exact uh, experimental value. You see that? This gives me strong confidence that this really is true. Okay? Fascinating. Just amazing. It's, it solves the second mystery. Why is there a slope of the values? It's because of the neutron distribution in the tomb. Now, I'm going to show you some values here, and, and the way this is printed out, this area is for the shroud below the body, the shroud to the right of the body, above the body, and to the left of the body, a as though these items can be folded right over into form a little box. Uh, then I'm going to show you the, the uh, left bench and the right bench. Now, as I go to the next one here, these values are probably too small uh, for you to see, but, and, uh, uh, but there they are, the whole thing, I'll show you closer up. Uh, this is the uncertainty. So down on, on the side benches, there's an uncertainty of about five years. Up here in the body regions, there's about a 12-year uncertainty. That's a statistical uncertainty due, the, due to the um, probabilistic style of, of the calculation. Uh, on the left side, you see here uh, that underneath the body, it, the, the date goes way up, 7,000 here. On the right side, on, above the body, and below the body. Uh, and then on the right side of the tomb, these are the peak values. And you see the peak here underneath the body is 4, uh, 8,459 years is the date that I'm predicting that carbon-14 would date if you could get a sample right at that point. Now, if I, take, if I take this whole row in yellow, wrap it around the body, you know, at, at a cross-section, across the, the, the maximum location, uh, this is what we get. This, this colored section is the cross section of his body. Underneath is the 8,459 years. On the top, it's 4,000 years. The reason being that the limestone underneath his body are reflecting the neutrons back up, which exposes the cloth twice, at least. Uh, over on the right side here, next to the wall, uh, up underneath where, where the patches would be, 4,500 years. On the opposite side, uh, away from the wall, is about 3,500 years. Now, the left side, the, the left side and the right side show some area uh, of yellow. The yellow area is where you get a, a, a 
date of 700 years for the Sudarium of Oviedo. So what I'm saying is that when it's, when it's taken off the head, it was placed just very conveniently on the side bench anywhere in those locations. Okay? And that is because the neutron flux falls off as it co comes back along the Y value. This is where the body is located. And then as you come back toward the entrance, the neutron flux falls off so rapidly. And that's just what the computer code gives. Now, an another point here. Some people talk about neutrons emitted in the limestone. Well, it's easy for me to do, so I just switched them over to being emitted in the limestone. The curve does not go through the three data points if you emit the neutrons in the limestone. There's no value for the face cloth uh, related to 5, 700 AD. Uh, and so the, my, my conclusion here that wherever the neutrons emitted, in the body, not in the limestone. Uh, so we have some summary items here. Um, if you assume that neutrons are emitted in the body, you can explain the th three different mysteries. Uh, and that explaining these three things by the one hypothesis is strong evidence that the hypothesis is true. Additional sampling and testing of the shroud of Turin ought, double underline, ought there, uh, to be performed to further test the hypothesis. Because testing and validating this hypothesis will prove that neutrons are released from Jesus' body in the tomb. It will invalidate the conclusion of the carbon-14 dating uh, to the Middle Ages. And it would thus indicate that the Shroud of Turin really is circumstantial evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Uh, contact information. Cell phone is my wife's cell phone. I, you, can call, you can call her and she will relay the message to me. Uh, and, and we'll be here uh, through Monday night. Uh, if you want copies of, of this talk, uh, we have several copies available here. Thank you. Thank you.